Hello everybody and welcome to today's episode of The Surge. Um, this is probably going to be my uh, last episode on anything to do with COVID for a while. Um, I think that we're all COVIDed out. Um, so today I wanted to talk about families of COVID patients who are in the ICU. Now, just a couple of clarifications. I got some feedback, which is always great. Uh, quick disclaimer, I am not a mental health expert. Uh, some of you have corrected me on certain concepts and points. I'm just trying to uh, give a narrative of, of my personal perspective on how I'm navigating this situation, which is extremely challenging. And I do agree with you that multidisciplinary care is uh, extremely, extremely important. Uh, the data points towards it. There is no question that having a social worker available, having a mental health expert such as a psychologist available, and having a full-blown psychiatry service available in your center makes everything that I've been talking about pretty much moot. Um, things like uh, psychological first aid are designed uh, for situations where you have overwhelmed your capacity to provide adequate mental health uh, care within your center. And I just want to clarify that point, because I think that I may have um, not clarified it as well as I should have. So I just want to make it very clear. Having said that, you know, today's topic is another mental health topic uh, that I wish to address. And it's a topic that, you know, I I've learned the most out from nurses. Um, Bita Dinashi, if you're listening, at Montreal General, uh, you rock. Um Thanks. Uh, you've saved me a lot of uh, grief when uh, dealing with the situation. So I think that everybody who works in an ICU knows that, that families are, are, are a cornerstone of, of our, um, our daily lives working in the ICU. Interaction with families forms a very big part of it. And as with the upsurge that's occurring with COVID-19, um, I, I do fundamentally believe that we're having trouble keeping up with families and providing them with uh, adequate care and support uh, given the circumstances. I, I do believe that somewhere around the world uh, we're hitting like a, a 6 out of 10 or a C plus grade instead of an A plus grade. And, you know, that's not to say that people aren't trying, but um, I can't emphasize this enough. So the role of families is key. Um it's been described in the treatment of uh, patients uh, post-ICU. Uh, family satisfaction is directly correlated with the patient's risk of developing PTSD and other uh, diseases within that or conditions within that spectrum. Um, there is also, in addition to that, a fair amount of data, mainly in the nursing literature, uh, that uh, your team does better when they interact with families regularly and the families know them. By the, your team does better, I mean subjectively your own team if quest if you i put them through a questionnaire will feel better working with each other having seen each other interact with families and i think that that's extremely important to understand in addition to that i do believe that there's a lot of of uh, misconceptions in terms of what families perceive so it's been studied extensively and um, families who are treated well and who are given a place to stay, close proximity to the ICU, such as a waiting room or an overnight room for them to stay, and are uh, empowered to ask questions and are empowered to participate in rounding, uh, tend to boost patient care and tend to be able to participate in patient care. So I can't emphasize this enough as, as part of, of what we have to address within the ICU. And when they have less than optimal experiences, when you're not providing adequate care and adequate support within the ICU, this tends to hurt families. It tends to make the second and the third time in the ICU a lot more difficult. And there's good data on that too. Um, the factors that are associated do not seem to be how comfortable the bed is or how big the television is. They do seem to center around uh, an association with, and it's similar in end-of-life care, uh, an association with how they are addressed, how regularly they're addressed, and who is involved in addressing them. It, it can't be just one person. It should be multidisciplinary. In an ideal situation, 
the nurses should participate as much as the doctors who should participate as much as mental health experts and social the social workers it should be that type of situation right and the quality of the communication across these levels almost dictates how families perceive things in an ICU and in end of life care and in the ICU and their perception will affect them long term it's not a customer rating situation right some of my colleagues especially physicians tend to think of it as customer ratings it's not customer ratings okay it, it's it's a completely different thing almost it's i i can't emphasize this enough guys um this your ability to perform well in these situations at this particular aspect of your management of the icu patient will have long-term payoffs for the patient's continuity of care and for the stability of the family social network, okay? And that's why I think that with uh, COVID-19, all of the things that we've done to enhance this experience for families, such as face-to-face -face interactions, having them around and rounds, having flexible visiting hours versus restrictive ones, uh, having patients being given long-term outlooks, uh, having them um, sort of experience that breaking point and live through it and survive it, no matter what the outcome is, you know, having them feel that you're in this journey with them and, and empowering them in that sense, all of these things, dedicated after rune rounds for families, etc., all of these things are very difficult to do in an era of COVID-19. And you know, it's because you have limited time, you're, because you're seeing 10 times more patients than you would normally see, let's be honest. You have limited contact. You yourself aren't in contact with the patient enough, and you can't be in contact with the family because of the situation, right? You have a limited knowledge base. I know we like to pretend that we know everything, but when it comes to COVID-19, I think that it's fairly okay to say every now and then that you don't know. You won't know if they'll get their sense of smell back, for example. You won't know how long they'll be on the ventilator. You won't know how their response be to it. All of these things are very hard for you to know. And we have limited resources. Our designated uh, practitioners, such as a dedicated nurse, a CPMP who's had extensive mental health training, may not be able to get through 10 new admissions a day, may not be able to get through 30 to 40 family meetings a day, right? And there are our centers where if you were to do it, quote unquote, perfectly, although I would contend that at this point, the enemy of good is perfect, but if you were striving to do it perfectly, you would have to participate in 40 multidisciplinary meetings a day, and that's just not gonna happen, right? So in the current situation, I will be honest with you, I do not know what the answer is. But when I go through the papers that I just put up for you, the content and the structure seems to be key. And I sort of did a, a quick survey um, with all of my colleagues, uh, I'm sure that all of you have this. Uh, we're all on different uh, platforms discussing things all the time. I did a quick survey of my colleagues online and in the places where they're dealing with uh, the COVID pandemic and where their ICUs are hit hard and their critical care and acute care services are hit hard. And by the way, uh, this is like a uh, pan acute care discussion that I've had. And I've asked them how they're addressing the concern of families. So this is what I've had. I've had like a good, I'd say, twenty percent that have had dedicated family nurses that are doing their best. And this is usually a CPMP and two or three of the retired nurses that are doing their best, who understand the terminology extremely well and have a vast amount of experience. Are, are doing their best to update the families on a regular basis, face-to-face, -face, because they have minimal contact with the patients themselves, right? Uh, in terms of, like, exposure contact. I don't mean contact in terms of knowledge-based contact or following up the patients. 30% uh, of my colleagues at attending level will phone the families on a daily basis, and they'll tell the families when they're going to call next. Um, some people have set up, like, these um, HIPAA-compliant bots, that alert them when families have questions and they feed back and feed forward through IM and they actually tell families when they're not available and when they are available. And it seems that 
at least in this one place that have done this, people have been okay with it. Nobody's uh, screamed at a doctor for not being available. And the doctors seem to be owning up in that they, they've taken ownership of it and, and they're answering genuinely. This is not at attending level, however. This is sort of at, I would say, R3 up to attending level. And it pops up uh, for a designated, like one person's role in the unit for four or five hours is just to handle that. It's one of the more high-end ivory tower units and they have the capacity to do that and I, I don't know if everybody else will especially with HIPAA compliance being an issue in terms of uh, written updates there are two places that actually fill in a form uh, that they post to families uh, via email and they provide email updates and that way everything is documented in the correct manner and you know I think that that's a pretty good idea um, other places do walk around rounds uh, to families during the restricted visiting hours. So in some places, about three out of ten places that I've talked to, uh, what, what's what been happening is that um, uh, they have about half an hour to talk to somebody over a speakerphone with a glass plate in front of you or with like a, not a glass plate, but inside a, a actual room and they can talk to them over the phone, but they can't necessarily walk into the COVID room. So they're talking to them behind a, a, a window. Um, and while they're talking to patients in that manner, uh, some of the physicians make it a priority to be around just to talk to families about that, right? Um, Again, like, I don't think that it's perfect. Um, I've sort of been one of those telephone guys, um, and I think that they appreciate that. They appreciate that I'm, I'm going to talk to them over the phone uh, at the end of the day uh, for me. Like, I'll take that hour or so at the end of my shift um, just before I sign out, and I talk to all the families and update them. And then I do a quick sign out with my team and a debrief whenever I can. And I'll tell you that it depends on the culture. So... Um, where I'm working right now in Kuwait, uh, traditionally the culture would rather have a face-to-face -face conversation, but people have been very understanding with us, and I appreciate that, and they're okay with over the phone most of the time, unless there's something like a consent for a procedure or something. Um, in other places, I think that it would depend on the culture. There are certain places where there, you, the family may not want to know a lot of information and then there are certain places where they want to know all the information and you know it depends it depends but in general i think when you're having these conversations it's the points that you bring across that are important so um this is my uh completely um non-meta-analyzed literature review things that worked out for me great seven point system that i've come up with that takes about five minutes over the phone and it's number one to summarize the previous meeting and recap number two to describe the situation uh with supporting information and the daily goals that we, we've tried to address for the day and if we've already reached them then i actually tell the family that so that's some news for them and number three is that i like to confirm their understanding of the current situation they're not going to understand it completely the first day, but at least you know where you're starting and where you're stopping at, what you have to recap on the next time, where they had difficulties. Number four, I address all of their concerns that I can over the phone. And sometimes that involves um, acknowledging uh, the things that we talked about previously, um, about how difficult their situation can be, the fact that they may, may not be able to make ends meet, etc. The fact that we can probably get them in contact with some social services, maybe even if it's only over the phone. Just address all of the concerns that you can. And then I recap the daily goal and the long-term plan that we're hoping for. And I listen to their concerns and ask them to get back to me and create questions for the next time. And then I re-offer the support a second time. So I tell them what services we have available and how the services can be delivered. Um, I think that there's a, a bunch of people locally in Kuwait that are very interested in providing telepsychiatry. And I think that it might be a good time for us to try and do that. Um, if any of you guys are listening, uh, please make it happen. I know that you're doing it for healthcare professionals, which is phenomenal. But I think that if, if we can get something done at, at family level, I think it would be great. And last but certainly not least, document everything and document the time and where you're going to call them again. Right? I think that, that those things just help immensely. Um, 
that's all I have to talk about today. Again, I apologize for not making the multidisciplinary um, discussion a little bit more nuanced. Um, I think that I should have mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, it was my mistake. Um, I, I should have prioritized it. Uh, please subscribe, and thank you for listening.